Good morning. For those of you who don't know, Todd works at Costco. Good little plug there, Todd. Let's open our Bibles this morning, please, to Romans chapter 1. As we continue our verse-by-verse study, we just started in the book of Romans last week. Romans chapter 1. And this morning we're going to be looking at verses 2 through 7. Let's go ahead and read those and then we'll pray. Romans chapter 1, verses 2 through 7. Which he promised before through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures. Concerning his son, Jesus Christ our Lord, who was born of the seed of David, according to the flesh, and declared to be the Son of God with power according to the spirit of holiness, by the resurrection from the dead. Through him we have received grace and apostleship for obedience to the faith among all the nations for his name, among whom you also are the called of Jesus Christ. To all who are in Rome, beloved of God, called to be saints, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Lord, as we come into your word once again this morning, we thank you, Father, that it is alive. We thank you that we can come expecting, Lord, to hear from you, Lord, because it is living. Lord, may you make our hearts ready uh, just to have good soil this morning to hear from you through your word. May your Holy Spirit have your work and your way this morning. In Jesus' name we pray. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. So as we come into verse 2, I want to take just a moment uh, before we really get into the study to clarify something from last week. Um, when we looked, if you just glance back at verse 1 with me, it says, Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle. And as we were talking about callings last week, um, one of the things I brought up about callings and giftings from the Lord, I, was, I brought up specifically, I was uh, we were talking about ushers at one point. And I got an email from a, from a sweet couple here in the fellowship, and and they said that I said the word that an usher could be mundane work. And mundane mean, meaning, number one, lacking in interest or excitement, dull. And that was not the word I intended to use. <laughs> Sincerely. Sometimes I teach and I just say something that's wrong, and, but this was not, I did not mean to say mundane. As a matter of fact, I remember even when I said it, it was like, that is not the word that you mean to say, Bill, because it wasn't in my notes. But I just want to say that because my heart wasn't to hurt anyone. And we were speaking basically of callings and giftings, and my heart was basically that there are, you know, um, loving acts of service and there are callings. Loving acts of service and there are callings. And, you know, when we go later on into the book of Romans, we're going to get into some of the giftings of the Holy Spirit and thus some of the callings that God is giving us, even as Christians. And so we'll get further into that. But I wanted to apologize and clarify that before we continue on this morning. I know it's hard to believe sometimes your pastor makes mistakes. Now my wife is a, like, amen. <laughs> verse 2. Let's come into verse 2 here this morning in this glorious letter of Romans. So we note that Paul comes in here and he says, which he promised before through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures. So what did God promise? Well, let's again glance back to verse 1. Paul, a bondservant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, separated what? To the gospel of God. So this is what he promised before through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures. The promise is the gospel, the good news of God. You see, God through his prophets in the Old Testament, the Holy Scriptures, he gave the gospel. 
he referenced this and, 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 and prophesied of this over and over and over throughout the Old Testament. Even going all the way back when Adam and Eve fell into sin, God promised that there would come one to deliver them. Genesis 3.15, you don't have to turn there. It says this, And I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your seed and her seed he shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his head as he was speaking to the serpent. Even then, since the beginning, God has promised a, a deliverer, the Messiah, the promised one of God. And here, basically, he's saying that, you know, which he promised before through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures. Now, what's interesting is that the nation of Israel is God over and over prophesied of this Messiah to come, this deliverer, they continued to believe that it was going to be from their earthly enemies, from their earthly and worldly problems. You, you see, they thought the rest, that he was going to come and rescue them from the rest of the nations. That, that they were going to come and set up his earthly kingdom and they were going to rule and reign with him. And the sad part was, is they were focused on the carnal. They were focused upon the worldly, on the things of the flesh. And they had become so focused on these things, so focused on the day-to-day -day things, that they lost sight of what they truly needed deliverance from, their own sin. And you see, that has happened much within our world today, even much within the church that we know we need deliverance perhaps from our bills or, you know, from this thing going on or from the government today or from the coronavirus or other things that are happening within our world. And we know we'd love to have deliverance from those things, but the main deliverance that we need is from our sin. And we need to understand this. Now, notice in verse 3, we are told exactly what the gospel was to come. Notice verse 3. The gospel to come was concerning his son, Jesus Christ our Lord. So again, we see that the gospel is concerning his son, God's son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Beloved in Christ, the gospel is not concerning anything else except the son of God, Jesus Christ, the Messiah, our Lord. You see, the gospel is nothing to do with happiness. It's nothing to do with deliverance from this world. It has nothing to do with many who falsely preach a false gospel today, a health and wealth gospel. The gospel is not about simply adding Jesus to our lives. Oh, I think I'll give Jesus a chance. I remember an old song that somebody had changed around, an old Beatles song, and it says, All we are asking is give Christ a chance. Jesus isn't standing there begging for people to come to him. But again, that's what we hear pro even preached from many pulpits today. Oh, please come. Just come to Jesus. The gospel is not simply about telling Jesus that you love him or receive him or want things from him. The gospel, the true gospel of God, is only and purposefully concerning his son, Jesus Christ our Lord. That's the true gospel. It is all about Jesus. So when we come to God, we need to come to him seeking his son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Again, we do not come to God for good news of being delivered from the government or the good news of trying to get my wife back because I committed adultery on her and she left me. We don't come from the good news of God to, you know, try to even clean up my life or to get out of debt or get off of drugs or to get better or even to have a loved one healed. Maybe we've all heard this. Oh, Lord, if you just heal my sister or my daughter or my wife or my husband or, you know, myself, I will give you my life. Or perhaps, Lord, if you're really out there and you just do this one thing for me, man, I'll serve you for the rest of my life. And some people think that's what the gospel is. They seek to make a deal with God, yet this is not why we come to him or even how we are to come to him. We are to come to God for the good news concerning Jesus Christ our Lord, period. 
He is to be the reason. Turn with me, please, to Acts chapter 16, the book of Acts. Chapter 16, just back to the left in your Bible. Chapter 16, starting in verse 29, very familiar verses to all of us here this morning. Acts 16, verse, verses 29 through 32, as we see Paul and Silas are in jail in Philippi, and the doors, the earthquake has just happened, the, the doors to the prisons have, have just flown open, and verse 29 this is the prison master. He called for a light and ran in and fell down trembling before Paul and Silas. And he brought them out and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? So they said, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved, you and your household. Then they spoke the word of the Lord to him and to all who were in his house. So we see that as they come, the gospel is, look, believe in the Lord Jesus, or on the Lord Jesus, and you'll be saved, you and your household. But notice in verse 32, they spoke the word of the Lord to him. They went on to do that. It doesn't stop at verse 31. They went on and described, what does it mean to believe in the Lord Jesus? They, they went on to share the gospel. Probably things, if you turn back with me, please, to Acts chapter 2. Acts chapter 2, starting in verse 37. Peter had just given the church's first sermon. <clears throat> and basically, he went on for the first sermon to tell them what buzzards they all were. All the sin, you know, these sins that they'd committed, that they had even killed the Messiah, the one, the chosen one who had come. Now, it's interesting in verse 37, as we drop in here, it says, Now when they heard this, I love this, you might want to underline this in the Bible, they were cut to the heart. They were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, Men and brethren, what shall we do? Man, they realized their depravity. They realized their sinfulness before the Lord. Verse 38, Then Peter said to them, Repent. And let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. And you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promises to you and to your children and to all who are afar off. By the way, I love marking when we're mentioned in the Bible. That's us. We are all who are afar off. And as many as the Lord our God will call. You see, guys and gals, the gospel has always been, ever since the Garden of Eden, and will always be about Jesus Christ our Lord. His death upon the cross for our sins. So we need to remember that. Now, look at verse 3 as it continues. Back in our text here in Romans 1, as it continues, we now see that Paul goes on to give the earthly credentials, or at least part of them, as to that Jesus Christ was the Messiah. Look at verse 3, who was born of the seed of David according to the flesh. So we note here that he now is referencing the Apostle Paul, as the Holy Spirit is breathing through him, tells us that Jesus Christ was born of the seed of the lineage of, of David according notice to the flesh in a moment we'll be reading about according to the spirit but you see as we read throughout the Old Testament the Messiah was to come through the line of David through the royal lineage of David as God has promised and even as we see here though Paul is writing to Gentiles in Rome he still points to the lineage, the Jewish lineage, by the way, as well, of Jesus Christ, the Messiah, and the Savior. Turn with me, please, to Psalm 132. We're just going to look at a few verses that have to do with the Messiah coming through the lineage of David. Psalm 132, starting in verse 11. Psalm 132. Verses 11 and 12. The Lord has sworn in truth to David. He will not turn from it. I will set upon your throne the fruit of your body. 
If your sons will keep my covenant and my testimony, which I shall teach them, their sons shall also sit upon your throne forevermore. In 2 Samuel chapter 7, verses 12 through 14, we read this. When your days are fulfilled and your rest with your fathers, I will set up your seed after you, who will come from your body, and I will establish his kingdom. He shall build a house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. I will be his father, and he shall be my son. So again, we see that throughout the Old Testament, and turn with me here, even though we're in Romans, go back to Acts chapter 2 again. And even in the first sermon that Peter gave, as we just referenced and looked at the end of it there, look at verse 29 with me, verses 29 and 30 of Acts chapter 2. We see that even Peter referenced this, that Jesus, the, the Messiah, would come through the lineage of David. Verse 29. Men and brethren, let me speak freely to you of the patriarch David that he is both dead and buried, and his tomb is with us to this day. Therefore, being a prophet, and knowing that God had shown him with an oath that the fruit of his body, according to the flesh, he would rise up the Christ to sit on his throne. So again, even coming from the Old Testament into the New, they knew that the Messiah was to come from the lineage of David. And thus the Apostle Paul affirms here within our text, verse 3 again, who was born of the seed of David according to the flesh. Now we're shown in Luke chapter 3 and in Matthew chapter 1 that Jesus, the fleshly side of Jesus that came from Mary, came through the lineage of David, the son of Jesse. Love that. So we see that Jesus, again, is fully man. And look at verse 4. We're going to see that he is fully God. Look at verse 4. And declared to be the Son of God with power according to the Spirit of holiness by the resurrection from the dead. So according to the flesh, he, is, he comes through the lineage of David, which he was supposed to, but he would be the son of God, even as David was promised back in the Psalms, he would be called the son of God, with power according to the spirit of holiness. And notice, by the resurrection of the dead. God the Father declared Jesus Christ to be the Son of God with power according to the Spirit of holiness. Here we see referenced that Jesus Christ was, is, and always shall be the Son of God. He is God. He is the second person of the Godhead, the triunity or trinity of God. And in declaring that Jesus is the Son of God here, by the way, all the Jewish readers would have gotten his point. He is declaring, in fact, that Jesus is God. So we need to understand that Jesus is God. Now again, notice here in verse 4, it says that this claim and this declaration was made with power. Notice it says that it was made with power according to the spirit of holiness. And the spirit of holiness referenced here is the Holy Spirit of God. Now it's interesting how there's some commentators out there, not very many, but they'll wrongly say this is the spirit of man. But since God is the only one who is holy, this is, can only reference his spirit. So notice again where it says here in verse 4, "...and declared to be the Son of God." with power according to the spirit of holiness, notice, by the resurrection from the dead. You see, you can go and visit, anybody here, raise your hand if you don't mind, if you visited the tomb of Jesus in Israel, what they call the tomb of Jesus. There are several here that have visited. The, was Jesus there or was it empty? Anybody? It's empty! You, you, you can't go, you, you can go to, uh, you know, uh, Russia, and you can, you know, visit Leningrad or whatever they call it now, but in, in there you can, you can go see Lenin literally lying in the tomb, in a glass tomb, and you can go visit his tomb. I actually went there when we were on a missionary trip, and it was kind of a trippy thing to see. They still had to shave him every once in a while because the hair continues to grow. It was the oddest thing in the world. 
But he was, there he is, and guess what? He's still there. He's still dead. But Jesus Christ, what makes his declaration to be the Son of God true by the power of the Spirit of Holiness is the resurrection from the dead. You see, guys and gals, Jesus Christ is not still in a tomb, and praise God that he's not. Praise the Lord that he's not. This is a declaration, and, and think about it. What declaration could we see as human beings that would be so mighty, so earth-shattering, so radically powerful that they could point to it and say that this has come by the power of the Spirit of God? And the word power there, by the way, is dunamis, where we get the word dynamite today. Well, we're, we're, how could we point? And we're told here in verse 4 that what we can point to, that the mighty Spirit of God, the, the, the power of God at work is the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Jesus is risen. He is risen. Anyone? He is risen indeed. You, you know, it's not just a thing that we remember once a year and celebrate once a year. We should be celebrating this and remembering it every single day. You see, when Jesus Christ rose from the dead, not only was his repeated word fulfilled, but so too was the power of God shown in and through him. You see, when he raised from the dead, every word that he spoke was validified. It was made valid. When he rose from the dead, we even see here that his declaration to be the Christ, to be the Son of God, is absolutely true because of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Again, you know, his rising from the dead was not simply to show off his divine power. It was to show that he is divine power. And that everything he said again is true. That Jesus Christ is the Son of the living and all-powerful God. And that he himself is God. Turn with me please to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Where Paul goes a little bit more in depth on the resurrection of Jesus Christ. 1 Corinthians 15 starting in verse 12. I'm going to read this out of the ESV. <clears throat> a little bit different. 1 Corinthians 15, starting in verse 12. Now, if Christ is proclaimed as risen or raised from the dead, how can some of you say there is no resurrection of the dead? But if there is no resurrection of the dead, then not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, then our preaching is in vain. And your faith? is in vain. We are even found to be misrepresenting God because we testified about God that he raised Christ, whom he did not raise if it is true that the dead are not raised. For if the dead are not raised, even Christ has not, or excuse me, not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile and you are still in your sins. Then those who also have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. If only in this life we have hoped in Christ, we of all people are to be most pitied. But in fact, Christ has been risen from the dead. You see, the resurrection shows that everything that Jesus Christ claimed, all that the apostles claimed about him is true. And when he rose from the dead, this was the final um, claim, the final sign, excuse me, that Jesus was who he claimed to be, and everything that he said was true. Every word, every prophecy, every jot, every tittle are all divine truths. This is a radical thing. This means that you and I one day will be resurrected from the dead, whether it be at the time of the, the rapture, you know, when, when those who have gone before us, you know, we will not precede them. They will go before us. There will be, you know, th this time. And you know what, what I love about the, the, the resurrection of Jesus Christ is that we can have that resurrection power in our lives every single day of our lives, every single moment as Christians. 
Now think about this. This means that basically as Christians, that we have this dunamis power of God available to us to live the life that God has called us to, commanded us to in his word. Well, Bill, Pastor Bill, I'm, I'm a little too afraid to go share the gospel than seek the dunamis power of, of, of God. Well, I'm a little too, I can't get over this sin or then that sin in my life. Seek the dunamis power of God. It is available, the resurrection. Hey, if God can resurrect Jesus Christ from the dead, he can help you overcome that sin in your life. Hey, I'm no longer an alcoholic, no longer a drug addict, no longer a sex addict, healed by the blood of Jesus Christ, the resurrected power of God at work in our lives. Too many of us, we can go around as anemic Christians, weak, especially within the world we're living in today. So much darkness, even so sadly, within the church. So many miss things that are, that are misbelieved. Oh, I can never overcome this mental illness. Oh, you know, I'm so overcome by my fear or depression. I need to go take these pills. Well, those pills don't help your fear or depression. They just numb you. Might as well go get drunk or go, get, go smoke some pot. It's the same thing. It's a numbing. How about we come to the cross and find strength? We find healing because God tells us that he restores what the locusts have eaten. The key comes back to, do we believe it? Well, we can believe it because Jesus Christ has resurrected from the dead. Well, how do we know that, Pastor Bill? Number one, we know that because God's word tells us that. I mean, look at history. What other figure in history has so affected the world as a whole? None. And remember who he was, by the way. He was a lowly carpenter. At the end of his life, he was followed by maybe five, six hundred people. It wasn't this huge movement. And all those people, by the way, for the most part, abandoned him at the cross. The power of God at work. I remember reading, if you, you look in... The Gospels in the book of Acts, even the apostles, they were afraid after Jesus died. They were afraid. They, they hid out in fear together, and, and, and it's like, oh, you know, what are we going to do? Oh, this and that. And then even when Jesus appeared to them, they were still afraid. And it wasn't until that time in the upper room when the Holy Spirit came down with tongues as of fire that the power of God and his Holy Spirit came and breathed life into the church of God. And we now have that resurrection power available to each one of us. That power that enables us to get through illness. So sometimes God will heal. Sometimes God won't heal. Sometimes God will provide financially. Sometimes he's going to say, no, I'm going to teach you something else. But as we trust in him and rest in him and find strength in him, we continue on and give glory to our God. And we spread the gospel of Jesus Christ as we are pressed out. Man, we are never forsaken by Jesus Christ. Look at verse 5. It goes on to say this. Through him, through Jesus Christ, we have received grace and apostleship for obedience to the faith among all nations for his name. Uh, the ESV translate part, the second part of this verse says, to bring about the obedience of faith for the sake of his name among all the nations. I love this. Through Jesus Christ, we have received grace. Do you understand that this morning? That through Jesus Christ, each one of you here can receive the grace of God. Nothing that we earn, nothing that we even have to do things to keep, but God's grace. And Paul tells us in another place that, that the, the grace of God is what empowers him to go forth in the gospel. When through Jesus Christ we have received grace, and Paul is speaking of his apostleship, but it's interesting, notice, for obedience to the faith. You know, a lot of us don't understand that when we receive the grace of God, it then enables us to then be obedient to God. 
It empowers us to walk in loving obedience with our God. I, I love this. Through him we have received grace and apostleship for obedience to the faith among all the nations. It is interesting to note that as the gospel is preached, we find freedom from our sin. As we talked about this last week, you know, our old slave master... And we now have become the slaves of righteousness, the slaves of God, and thus we are saved from our sins, saved unto righteous works. Paul tells us here that this will bring about, as we're saved from by his righteousness, this will bring about obedience to the Lord as well. And notice again that this is amongst the nations. Thus, all from any nation, as we return away from our sins and believe in Jesus Christ to be the Lord and Savior of our lives and are born again of the Holy Spirit, it doesn't matter what nation we're from. All nations. I love this. That, that, that again, even then that God works about us, we're born again of His Holy Spirit, He starts to conform us into the image of His Son, Jesus Christ. And part of that is obedience. Notice to God the Father, to be obedient to him. Why? Because we love him. Jesus said, if you love me, you'll obey my commandments. I, I love this. Again, it's not that we do these things to be saved, but because we are saved, to be the fruit of our lives. You know, I, we talked about last week, we talked about legalism. And then even with, in Luke chapter 6, we're doing the week before we were in Luke where Jesus was condemning legalism. And basically, legalism is doing things for God because we think we have to. Because we're afraid or because we want to look good to people or this is just what we, we're supposed to do. Instead of, you know what, Lord, I love you so much, I'm going to do these things for you. I love you so much, I'm not going to do those other things. And again, these are all the, the outpourings and the working of the Holy Spirit who dwells within us and His grace working in and through us. Look at verse 6. Among whom you also are the called of Jesus Christ. Now, we talked about last week the specific callings that come as Christians once we are you know, um, called. And I would say that this here is referring to the more general calling of, our, of coming to faith in Jesus Christ. So basically that there would be this general calling and we respond and, and you know, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever would believe in him should not perish. Call, the calling to, to people to come to faith in God, to come to faith in Jesus Christ. Now look at verse 7. We see basically <clears throat> the address of Paul's letter. He said, To all who were in Rome, beloved, called to be saints. So again, as we talked about last week, Paul was writing to the believers in Rome. He really had a heart to go to Rome to share the gospel, and thus he, he hadn't been enabled by the Lord to go, and so he wrote this letter. And so that's who he's writing to, to all who are in Rome. And I love how he addresses this. Beloved of God. Do you know, do you, do you look at yourself again in the mirror? We talked about this last week, looking in the mirror, seeing his servant. But do you also look in the mirror and see, beloved of God? Do, do you see that? Do, do you look at yourself and say, I am one who is beloved of God? So many in our world today, even probably within this church, have been hurt by people over the years. Maybe by a mother, by a father, by a relative, by a teacher, by other kids, or different things even growing up. And a lot of people, we come to have this tinted view, tainted view of who we are. Oh, God could never really love me. God could never really care about me. Even, oh yeah, I'm a Christian, I believe, and I'm his son, I'm his daughter, but he's not going to love me like he loves Billy Graham or Elizabeth Elliot or some of the people here in the church. They're so nice and sweet, and, and I'm just, I'm, I'm to this or I'm to that. And you hear the words echoing of, of somebody within your brain, within your mind who puts you down, and so you forget that you're a beloved of God. The word beloved there is a form of the word agape. 
You see, when we come into that relationship with God through his son of Jesus Christ, we become his beloved. Doesn't that like bring a peace to your heart this morning? Doesn't it like, when you think about that, man, you know what? I know that I'm a slave of God. I know I'm a son. I know I'm a child. I know I'm part of the body, but I'm also the beloved of God. He looks at you, he looks at me, and he sees his beloved. Man, I don't know about you, but when my wife looks at me and just looks at that, and she says, hubba hubba. I know it's crazy to think, but she does. And she'll say, hubba hubba. And I'm just like, and, and it's, seriously, it still brings a little bit of, you know, it's like, oh, thanks, man. It, you know, makes me feel kind of good. And God looks at you and says, hubba hubba. Because you are his beloved. He's like, man, you, you are my beloved. Do you understand this? I love you. I love you so much. I even loved you when you were in sin. And I love you now that you're in my son, Jesus Christ. I love you. You are my beloved. And notice it goes on to say, so to the saints who are, to all who are in Rome, to beloved of God, notice, called to be saints. Now this doesn't mean that you need to get the stigmata. Some of you will understand this if you were raised in certain church where, you know, it, it, you, there are only certain people who are saints. If you are good enough and, you know, did all these great works and you had the, you know, the wounds of Jesus appearing on your flesh and different things. Oh, that's a saint. Boy, woo, we need to aim to kind of be like that person. And that's what they'll say. Sometimes they'll hang likenesses of those saints around their necks or in their cars or in their homes or different things. They'll bury them in the backyard if they've lost something. I mean, it, 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 or they want to sell their house. I forget it all, the, the, the silly stuff. Look, guys and gals, when we come to Jesus Christ, we become saints in Jesus Christ. There's no such thing as a better saint and a worse saint. We're, we're all saints in Jesus Christ. Now, we're all at different levels of maturity, different levels of sanctification, and we can talk about that. But we've all been called to be saints. You know what I like, though, to remind us is how about we remember to act like it? You know, sincerely. And again, that doesn't mean go around and like, oh, pause. Oh, 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 oh. And just like, you know, I'm so godly, and you're lucky to be around me just to take in my aura. I mean, it's just silly. Just to be, but to remember who we are. We're God's beloved, but we're also called to be saints, so let's act like it. Let's, I want to walk in the power of the Spirit of God. I want to be on fire for Jesus Christ. I want to share. I want to be that light that I am. We are the light of the world. We are the salt of the earth. Notice what he goes on to say here. I love this. Grace to you and peace. Grace to you and peace. Anybody here need more peace in your life? If you can raise your hand. I'll raise my hand first. You know, sometimes we get it so mixed up. We, we go seeking for peace instead of seeking for God. Do you notice what comes first here? Notice again. Grace to you and peace. You see, I don't believe there's any true peace in this world without the grace of God. I've known so many people and heard of so many people that have killed themselves, committed suicide over the years. I've, I've heard people who write songs and who will get, talk about articles that say they're a Christian, but there's just something missing. And maybe that's you here this morning. Oh, I'm a Christian, but man, I just don't really have peace in my life. I, I just don't have this power that you're talking about, Pastor Bill. I don't have, you know, it's like, well, you need to come to the grace of God. <laughs> I keep waiting for this to start budding. You know, the, send me the reference to the Old Testament. Sorry, Aaron's, yeah. <laughs> so anyway... <laughs> But you see, I think there are a lot of people who have a form of godliness but deny the power thereof. They know about Jesus, and, and maybe some of you here, maybe some listening or watching, you know about Jesus. You've been brought up, you've heard, you, you even read your Bible sometimes, and, and yet there's still a disconnect. You, you know about him, but do you know him? Have you repented of your sins, believed on the Lord Jesus Christ, and been born again of the Spirit of God? Jesus didn't say you, you should be born again. It'd be a nice idea. 
or you could be, no, he said, you, you must be born again, Jesus said. And he goes on to explain to be born again of the Spirit of God. He doesn't say you must be religious. You must be brought up in Calvary Chapel and make sure you partake and do all the things of Calvary Chapel and then you'll be saved. No, you must be born again of the Spirit of God. And to be born again means we come and we receive the grace of God. And as we receive the grace of God, we have the peace of God. You see... The greatest peace we can have is peace with God over our sins. That's the base of, of, of our lives as Christians. Because once I have the peace of God for my sins, everything else that comes at me is just kind of superfluous. It's just kind of like, eh, that's no big, eh, no big, oh, cancer, eh, you know, eh, no big deal. Because I know I'm going to heaven. I know I've been forgiven. I know that this around me is temporary. Well, there's the coronavirus out there, and I don't have too much peace about, you know, anything because the coronavirus is here. Well, you might want to go back and read Matthew 24 and 25 because there's still, if we believe we're living in the last days, which I do, there's going to be earthquakes, pestilences. And, and by the way, because we're American Christians doesn't mean that we're immune to all those things. We could all die here of the coronavirus. Praise God, let's go to heaven. You have an amen? Yeah. Amen. There could be an earthquake that Jesus talks about. There could be other things that happen within the weather cycle that that word can refer to. There's nations rising against nations, all these different things. And we can get so afraid instead of just being at peace. I got the grace of God. You know, you know, and, and it's just like, you know, one of the, I've got a, 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 a was it that river of, I've got a river of life and, and these other joyful songs about peace of God ruling over our hearts. Do you have that? Guys and gals, it starts with the grace of God because look at how this verse continues. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. You want more peace in your life? Get more of Jesus in your life. And by the way, that means to have less of you, less of me. You see, my flesh is what likes to worry. My flesh cares about itself. Amen? My flesh doesn't want to put off the old stuff. My flesh really is comfortable in, in, in going on with the way that everything's were. And let's, let's keep everything the way things was. I know you're now born again, but let's just keep it all. But that's where the, 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 the enemy comes in and uses our flesh to, to bring fear. Have you ever got the, the thing from the doctor, hey, you have cancer? I got the call. We're driving down to vacation on the way to California, going up that hill. We're driving down the five, and you know, you kind of come out of Medford, and, and you're going up the hill into California towards Shasta, and I get the call. And it's like, you have melanoma skin cancer. I'm like, and my friend, Lisa Levernois, literally the week before just died of melanoma skin cancer. And Talia and the girls are in the car, and I'm like, uh-huh, mm-hmm, oh, hey, uh-huh, all right, yep, yeah, okay, thanks, Doc, bye. She's all, oh, what do you say? It's melanoma. What? You didn't ask him this and ask him that? And I was like, no, uh-uh, I didn't, I didn't. And because I'm a guy, right, I just... I'm kind of stupid sometimes. So she has me pull over and we call, and then we pray. It's like, Lord, this is in your hands. Is it can be a little scary? Of course, to our flesh it is scary. You know, to, to, to Lee and my girls, like, are we going to lose my husband and my dad? But you know what? To God, is like, look, trust in me. I, I died upon the cross, Jesus says. I rose from the dead. I have the power over everything in this whole universe. And you're my child. You're my beloved, and I love you. And even in the midst of these things, when the storms come, you can have peace. But notice, again, it comes from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Too many of us think, man, if I just had more money in the bank account, I'd have peace. If I just had fame or that one job I wanted, or if I just got that husband or that wife, man, I would have peace, boy. Uh-uh. <laughs> I'm not kidding. God uses husbands and wives to, to, to ruffle us up, to hone us down. Just as he uses one another, it's called iron sharpening iron if it's a good Christian marriage. 
I'm not saying that in a mean way, in a kind of joking way at first, but it's the truth. If you're not happy now, by the way, you're not going to be happy once you get married. Oh, well, you complete me. You know, those silly things from the movies or books or whatever. It's like, silly. They won't complete you. The only one that can complete you is Jesus Christ. Again, that's why so many that claim Christ but that, that are still miserable is because they don't really have Christ. You know, some, when somebody gets up and sings a song you know, about God that I still haven't found what I'm looking for, Guess what? They haven't. Even though they'll say, I believe in Jesus and the kingdom come in the song and everything, you know, but it's like, no, dude, if you find Christ, you find Christ. You've been born again of the Spirit of God. You have his grace and his peace because that comes from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Hey, as we're closing, you want more peace in your life? Get more of Jesus and less of you. I'm not kidding. Put off the old. Go through the New Testament. Man, it's so radical. How many different ways it says, deny yourself, pick up yourself, cross and follow me. It says, put off the old, put on the new. I mean, continually, crucify the old. I mean, it's just over and over and over. God is saying the same thing. Paul, as John the Baptist said, I, I must decrease, he must increase. Have more of Jesus in your life and you'll have so much more peace. Be on your knees in prayer. Be fasting. Be reading his word and walking in loving obedience. Be here and be in fellowship, getting to know Christians and loving each other. Loving the law, sharing the gospel. And you're going to have a peace of God that is beyond all human understanding will be guarding your heart and your soul and your mind. Let's pray. <clears throat> Lord, as we read this beautiful introduction to this wonderful book of Romans, Lord, I pray that these truths, Lord, that Paul just, man, puts right out there even in a way that's so for granted, that we would begin to take them for granted in, in a good way, Lord. That they would become such a part of our life, Lord, such a part of, of walking in your grace and your truth and having your peace, Lord. Father, I pray for each one here, Lord. I pray for each one, Lord, even as that are watching or listening. And Lord, we lift up those who are fighting this coronavirus and other things going on in their lives. May you touch and heal and strengthen. And most importantly, may you be glorified in the midst of all this, Lord. May we lift you high, Lord. Father, we lift ourselves up to you. We lift our country up to you. We pray for those in authority over us, Lord that we may live peaceably, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Let's stand.